You know, there's a tradition in movies that the second one is never as good as the first. This ain't that kind of sequel. What's that you say? <laughs> That's not possible. That first bust-in video was pretty harsh. That means I will do that. You'd have to do something completely preposterous like debunk Musk's white paper itself. And we all know that that's just not possible. No, 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 no. Surely that's just not possible. Hell, this is such a debunk that it'll even change the way that you see movies. Like, say, for instance, how this is directly related to the Hyperloop. We had to come up with something. A nuclear something. deterrent, because that always calms everything right down. Remind me again how you made your fortune, Stark. Uh, not just that, but this as well. Yeah, big man in a suit of armor. Take that off, what are you? Genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. And if you think this is just some reference to Elon Musk, not even close. Yeah, if you pay close attention, it's quite obvious. But no spoilers yet. Answers at the end. To set the stage, back in 2016, I made my first busting video on the Hyperloop, which has stood the test of time remarkably well. Come 2020, uh, these guys decide that they're going to expose all the mistakes in that video. Um, so yeah, spoiler alert. This is what it looks like when someone with no knowledge or experience of vacuum systems try to debunk someone who has 20 years experience in working with vacuum systems. Let's start with something elegant, but devastating. Over to you, Joaxan. Thunderfoot makes fun of the Hyperloop linear motor demonstration. Sure, it wasn't a complete Hyperloop. <laughs> no, it wasn't quite a complete Hyperloop. You know, he's just missing one or two key components. Like, say, for instance, a vacuum tube a, and a pod that people could actually sit in or airlocks or stations it was basically a bargain basement maglev. But, you know, this is a comment that crops up a lot on my Hyperloop videos that, oh, you're, you're, you're too critical. This is their Kitty Hawk moment. Of course, you can't expect them to get it to work straight out of the bag. Eh, except, no. The simple reality is the Hyperloop is at least as old as a Kitty Hawk. Goddard, the guy who the Space Center is named after, was writing about the Hyperloop, or the VAC train as it was then known, in about 1910, less than 10 years after Kitty Hawk took to the skies. And after some 70 odd years, Kitty Hawk had matured into Concorde. Meanwhile, the only thing that had changed on the Hyperloop over those 70 years was the quality of the drawings. And here we are, some 50 years after that, and now Elon Musk plagiarizes the idea of the Hyperloop and passes it off as his own. You got that from Vickers. Work in Essex County, page 98, right? Yeah, I read that too. But it would be for, for a fifth mode of transports. Were you going to plagiarize the whole thing for us? Do you have any thoughts of, of your own on this matter? I, I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. The Hyperloop? Uh, Hyperloop. But you, is that your thing? You come into a bar, you read some obscure passage, and then pretend you, you pawn it off as your own? Is your own idea just to impress some girls? It's called the Hyperloop. The Hyperloop? Uh, Hyperloop. But don't worry, we've got competent media. I'm sure they will diligently research this and work out that the Hyperloop is in fact a hundred year old idea that was simply plagiarized by Elon Musk. Sounds like something with Elon Musk written all over it, wouldn't you say? Well, there's a good reason for that. Turns out that the original idea for the Hyperloop came from none other than the Tesla founder himself. When it was first conceived by Elon Musk in 2013, the brand new method of transport brought forth by the entrepreneur and billionaire Elon Musk. Elon Musk first described his idea for a futuristic transportation system that would send passenger pods through tubes at speeds of hundreds of miles an hour back in 2013. Since it was first proposed in 2012 by Elon Musk. Tesla co-founder Elon Musk first proposed the idea in 2013 and the first Hyperloop will be built in Dubai by 2021. In reality, the only thing that has changed on the Hyperloop over the last hundred years is now the uh, quality of the computer-generated graphics. Anyway, where were we? 
ah, that's right, I was having all of my mistakes exposed. At minute mark 22, he then goes on to say how much better and safer airplanes are. Well, yeah, planes are the safest form of transport. You'd have to be pretty dumb to argue against that. But why do I suspect you're about to try? Seriously? As if no plane ever crashed in the history of humanity. Yes, you can still have plane crashes and have planes be the safest form of transport. And don't forget that airplanes are a very mature, over 100 year old technology. Yes, strange that, isn't it? One of these emerged as a viable technology and the other one didn't. Now, some cynical people, of course, might say there are very good reasons for that. He then goes on to say that once in the air, airplanes are super safe, nothing can go wrong anymore, and they cannot be targeted by terrorists anymore. Uh, uh, come on, at least try with your straw men. This is what I actually said. Now, when they're near to the ground, of course, they can be shot at. But once in the air, they very quickly go beyond the range of all but the high-end military weapons. That's something that's simply not the case with the Hyperloop. There you go. You got it. I make it very clear that unless you've got some fairly advanced military grade surface to air missiles, you cannot shoot down a plane at altitude. You know what would be really dumb? Like astronomically dumb, like being dumb in the Olympics dumb would be to say, look, here's a plane that was shot down by a military grade surface to air missile. Boom, that proves Thunderfoot was wrong that you need military grade surface to air missiles to shoot down planes at altitude. <laughs> Take it away, Sebastian. How about Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, which was shot down on the 17th of July 2014 while flying over eastern Ukraine, killing all 298 people on board? Yes, let's see. Malaysia Flight 17 was shot down by a Buck surface-to-air missile. Not just high-end military hardware, but the exact same Buck SAM launcher that I had in my original video. But once in the air, they very quickly go beyond the range of all. As if Hyperloop was the only possible terrorist target. Oh yeah, and regarding the terrorist argument. Yeah, yeah right, okay. So to shoot down a plane at altitude, you need something like this. Not only that, you need the plane to basically fly over your SAM site. Otherwise, the missiles don't have the range. To destroy the Hyperloop, you need a single 50 cal armor piercing round. Current retail cost about $10. And then just to shoot a hole in the hype loop tube at any point in its 600 kilometer length. Oh, and it can be fired by a handgun. Or you might want to brace your wrist a little for that one. Then Thunderfoot says something funny again at minutes 23 seconds 21. He says that anyone with a rifle could easily destroy the whole Hyperloop tube by shooting at it. Seriously, he said that. In reality, a rifle would leave just a small dent in a one inch thick steel tube. A small dent. Uh, yeah, unless you live in America, where out in the desert, quite a lot of signs actually look like this. And for a fairly simple reason where you can get 0.5 BMG rounds. We used a silver and red tip armor piercing incendiary tracer and the weapons to fire them quite easily. So for today's video, we have a 55 pound anvil and we're gonna see how it holds up against the 50 BMG, AKA the 50 cal. With the right rounds, those don't struggle with getting through an inch of steel. Oh, wow. You can see where that 50 cut down into that anvil. That is awesome. A rifle would leave just a small dent in a one inch thick steel tube. A small dent. You can see through the hole. He's going to do something. By that argument, you should also not drink water. Because Hitler also drank water. And now to wrap up that slam dunk, she's going to get the most wrong in the least amount of time. Take it away. Wax on. In the end, Thunderfoot makes fun of the Hyperloop linear motor demonstration. Sure, it wasn't a complete Hyperloop. 
only a linear motor. But did he even bother to watch the Hyperloop competition? Oh no! I, I, I'm so busted. My, my mistakes have been exposed. How could this possibly have happened? Oh, hang on. No, wait. Hang on. That's right. It's because the video that they're criticizing was put up six months before the Hyperloop competition even took place. They are criticizing me for not putting in things that hadn't actually happened yet into my video. But not that it greatly matters, because when they did occur, I made several videos debunking those as well. And but I'm sorry, I interrupted Sebastian and Waxon in the middle of screwing up even more badly. But did he even bother to watch the Hyperloop competition? They have pods which are to scale, going at 463 kph. I mean, this is just sheer fractal wrongness. No, the Hyperloop competition did not have full-sized pods on it. What you've got there is actually video from Hyperloop 1, which was later bought by Virgin Hyperloop. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is what the first Hyperloop competition looked like. Now it's about to kick off. Remember, the SpaceX pusher will bring it up to speed, then it will detach and let Hyperloop MIT do its thing. Okay, you ready for this? So the uh, pusher is going. It's accelerating the pod. The pod's getting faster and faster. 30 kilometers an hour, 40 kilometers an hour, 50, and so forth, up to 60, 70. And it's released the pod, and the pod stopped. <laughs> uh, I have to go maybe, I don't know, 50 meters or something. Elon Musk decided to host a competition. He told the world, come up with Hyperloop designs and let the best design win. Indeed, the winning team actually only managed to go slightly further on its own. So here we go, the push is off and it's accelerating the pod. 30 kilometers to that, 50 kilometers to 60, 70. Wow, it's a record, 80 kilometers an hour. 80, 90 kilometers per hour. And it releases the pod and the pod stops. One of the things this competition is for is to show the world that we can do this and convince them that we should build it somewhere and get the ball rolling. But did he even bother to watch the Hyperloop competition? They have pods which are to scale, going at 463 kph. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at those uh, full scale pods that they had in the first Hyperloop competition, shall we? Up top here, inside, you see we have the seat where the dummy goes. In fact, if my memory serves me correctly, there was only one pod in the first Hyperloop competition that was actually big enough to take a full-sized human. This is really all about is advancing the state of transportation, trying new things that have never been done before. Oh, no, no, not the not the big, not the big, not the big! And that was in the first year. In the subsequent years, it basically became a competition to make the most overpowered electric car that would run on a rail that you could do. So the Hyperloop pods eventually evolved to the point where they were so small that 40 students sat there grinning, looking at a pod they designed, which couldn't even take an action man. But on the bright side, they did show how fantastically safe and reliable the system was for running small, electric cars. But what about that video that they had of the uh, full-sized pod going at 4,000 kilometers per hour? Well, spoiler alert, it's not actually a full-sized pod. It's an empty fiberglass shell running up and down on that little electromagnetic skate we saw earlier. It's from a company called Hyperloop One, which has since become Virgin Hyperloop, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with the Hyperloop competition. It wasn't a complete Hyperloop, <laughs> only a linear motor. But did he even bother to watch the Hyperloop competition? <clears throat> they have pods which are to scale, <clears throat> going at 463 kph. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, even if I was trying, I'm not so sure I could get that much wrong in 15 seconds. Now, I do have a slight correction to make to my last video, which <laughs> perversely makes it even more devastating. You see, I said that you know, these people, Waxan and Sebastian, had no knowledge of science or vacuum systems, which was a fairly reasonable deduction to make, given that Sebastian here was struggling with some of the most simplest 
concepts in physics, you know, high school level stuff. You know, my original video, I said that, hey, look, they want to make this out of a single piece of tube. Well, metal expands when it gets hot, so you can calculate how much longer it's going to be on a hot day versus a cold day. And the difference in the length of the Hyperloop there would be about 300 meters, about the length of three football fields. It's as simple as physics gets. You know, you get a bar of metal and you have one temperature, and then you heat it up a unit amount of temperature and it expands a certain amount. And that amount that it expands per unit temperature is the linear expansion coefficient. It holds over most sensible temperature ranges. And Sebastian here manages to mangle that formula into thinking that, no, the two temperatures aren't the temperature before and after. It's the temperature of both ends of the piece of metal. That it would vary by an incredible 300 meters in the case of 40 degrees Celsius temperature difference between both ends. But wait, wait, this argument would only count in the case that we would see, for example, minus 20 degrees Celsius at one end of the Hyperloop, and then this temperature would gradually increase all the way to plus 20 degrees Celsius at the other end of the Hyperloop. Because that is how the temperature variation formula, which he probably used, Used works. However, in reality, of course, there would never be a scenario where we would witness a 40 degrees Celsius temperature difference along a length of 600 kilometers. Imagine having minus 20 degrees Celsius in San Francisco while at the same time having plus 20 degrees Celsius in Los Angeles. It sometimes helps to do a bit of physics, you know? I mean, this is flat Earth levels of understanding of physics. So I just assumed that the guy couldn't have any sensible education on this. Well, it turns out the guy actually has a PhD in physics. And my eyes just popped out of that when Dave from EV Blogs passed this on via Twitter. Cool, so here he is, Sebastian, PhD. He's working with his wife, Jixuan Wang, on the YouTube channel, to the future. And this is from the Lifeboat Foundation, safeguarding humanity. Uh, he born in Romania, moved to Germany, studied at the Technical University of Munich, who I assure you are rolling their eyes pretty hard right now. Maybe about to become fatal eye rolls. Um, yeah, he earned his PhD in theoretical laser physics. <laughs> Let's take a quick look at that. Uh, yeah, it, it's all going to be photonic shit, you know, modeling of lasers. It would just be a bunch of, yeah, quite, I, I sincerely hope someone actually checked this. Like, um, he, he, the guy who screws up uh, linear expansion coefficients like this. Now, how this actually would work is that, of course, we would see many temperature fluctuations along the entire length of the Hyperloop. Meaning the Hyperloop would contract, expand, contract, expand, contract, expand, and so on and so forth along the entire length. Therefore, in reality, the length contractions and expansions would just on average cancel each other out along the way. Uh, to come to the conclusion that metals don't expand on hot days. Mathematically speaking, the sum over all length variations along the entire tube is according to the length, contraction and expansion formula equal to the sum over alpha times all the temperature fluctuations along the entire tube. Alpha being the expansion parameter, so therefore a constant, we can pull alpha in front of the sum so that we have alpha times the sum over all temperature fluctuations. But since the temperature goes up, down, up, down, and so on and so forth, delta t has an alternating sign. So plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on and so forth. Therefore, the sum over all the delta t's will on average cancel each other out. Now summarizing everything, we saw that the devil lies always in the detail. Superficially, an argument might sound logical, but then you dig deeper into the physics and then the argument starts falling apart very quickly. Well, actually, no. If you stick to real physics, it's fine. If you go for alternative physics, then yeah, you're right, it falls apart pretty quickly. Watching a video like this without technical expertise or a background in physics or engineering, one might even believe this guy. There just aren't enough facepalm memes 
at this point. And scrolling through the comment section, there apparently are enough people to believe him. We made this video to show you that we should always do our own research. Yes, and I graciously thank you for all the comedic value we got out of the, uh, the, the research that you shared with us. By that argument, you should also not drink water. Because Hitler also drank water. Ah, and for all of this, he is on the advisory board of the Lifeboat Foundation, safeguarding humanity. Let's take a look at their advisory board. This is where our hero, Sebastian, is on. I'm sure it'll be a... Uh, well, well, let's see if we can find him. Oh, no, that's the Asteroid and Impact Board. And we got the Asteroid Board. Okay. <laughs> See if we can find Sebastian on this list, shall we? Um, uh, okay, we're about 25% of the way through. Let's see if we can scroll through the rest of it. And uh, we, might, we might have to do a search here to see if we can find uh, uh, Sebastian's position on the advi advisory board. <laughs> oh my god, they just want to do them alphabetically at the end. Right, okay, let's try this. Sebastian... No. Ah, there he is. So he is on their advisory board amongst all these uh, professionals. Uh, <laughs> what board is he actually on? <sighs> He's on the futurist board. Of course he is. <sighs> so, congratulations. If you understood the linear expansion coefficients, you're smarter than at least one YouTuber with a PhD. Now, I'm really not sure why they felt the need to come out and defend the virtue of Elon Musk's white paper some seven years after it came out, when for about five of those years, people have actually been trying to build these things and have worked out that almost everything in the white paper is bullshit. It's something that Elon Musk would just be overjoyed if people never looked at it again, if it just faded into history. It's something that embarrasses him. And you know what? I wouldn't have even looked at it again had not Joaxan and Sebastian not insisted that I do. And you know what I found when I actually looked at it in detail? Yeah, this doesn't end well for Elon Musk. And not in a way that's actually difficult to understand. You know, if you understand the thermal expansion stuff, then by the end of this video, you will understand why this here is fundamentally and fatally flawed. Now, you might want to know, how do I know that this is an embarrassment to Elon Musk? Well, let me show you. So here we are on the uh, wiki page for the Hyperloop, which of course says that it was all invented by Elon Musk through the, the white paper in August 2013. But let's take a look at the references, shall we? Let's come down to the reference section where we find the very first reference is Musk, Elon, white Hyperloop Alpha. And if you take a look at the bottom left, you'll see it says Hyperloop Alpha paper uh, PDF at SpaceX. Let's take a look at that, shall we? Why, that's bizarre. That looks like they've deleted it and now I have it redirecting from the Hyperloop to SpaceX. Let's just do a search for Hyperloop white paper, shall we? And the very first thing that comes up is Hyperloop Alpha at SpaceX. Let's take a look at that. <laughs> it just redirects to SpaceX. Now you've got to ask yourself a question. Why, if someone has invented this completely amazing revolutionary new method that's going to be a fifth mode of transport that's going to completely change the way we think about transport, would they delete it off their website and have it redirect to something else? Maybe it's time we took a little bit of a closer look at that Hyperloop white paper. I mean, let's be clear, before we actually get into the guts of this, the warning signs were there very early on, when just a year or so after the uh, white paper was published, Elon Musk was asked whether he favoured electromagnetic levitation or aerodynamic levitation. And his answer was wheels. Which one do you prefer? Still the air readings or do you go with magna? Uh, okay, it's a, it's a good question. So, uh, you know, the... <clears throat> a couple of minutes later. Um, so... I'd probably advocate um, 
wheels. And, uh, and <laughs> Why, that's an odd thing for a genius to say when his only contribution to the uh, Hyperloop was, we're going to run it on air skis and compressors. Pretty complicated, Elon. It's like a tube with an air hockey table. It's really, I swear, it's not that hard. <laughs> yeah, it's so easy that you abandon it completely in favor of a regular train that runs in a vacuum tube. Wow, <laughs> completely revolutionary. But it would be for, for a fifth mode of transports. I, I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. If it's so easy, I've just got one question. Why haven't you done it yet? I mean, could it be that the white paper is so chock full of humiliatingly trivial errors? The blueprints are pretty complicated. Well, blueprints are always kind of complicated. And I mean, yes, there's math. Maybe I ought to take a little bit of a closer look at that white paper. You know, when it first came out, I just gave him the benefit of the doubt. Thunderfoot then makes an argument where we think that either he didn't look at the Hyperloop white paper in detail or he doesn't understand the concept of the Hyperloop pot. But spoiler alert, when you actually go through the details, it's bad. It's really, really bad. Now, the air skis thing was always bullshit. I mean, I've used air bearings before. Motors, no. Air, go on. So you move a diffractometer and sure the levitation levels were minuscule and this diffractometer weighs yeah, a few tons or something i can't remember the pressure on but it was significant you can tell by the noise okay and the floor had to be polished to the point where it was almost optically flat. Otherwise, the defractometer tended to stick on the floor. Now, Musk is proposing using those on something that is heavier than this machine and then have it traveling at the speed of sound. And well, what's his clearance? In the white paper, it says about a millimeter, about the thickness of a toenail. Yeah, a fat man farts in this thing and you're gonna be grinding metal at a thousand miles per hour. <laughs> it's not so much in space, no one can hear you scream, but in a hyperloop, no one will hear you being smeared down and inside the tube at about the speed of sound. Yes, this was actually one of Elon Musk's hyperloop competition. This is their beloved leader, Elon Musk, who was such a genius when he was building his Hyperloop tube that he didn't realize that it would get rusty when it gets wet. I mean, where do you think all that dust is coming from? Oh, and the pod, which I should stress, is really little more than an overpowered electric car, which consists of basically nothing other than batteries and a motor. That <laughs> hits a nail and it almost destroys everything. And that was merely a hundred odd kilos of pod not 15 tons of pod, and it's not traveling at the speed of sound, but only at about 200 miles per hour. So why do you think, okay, let's take another look at the white paper. What sort of air pressure are they trying to do that levitation at? Why? One tenth of an atmosphere, at which point I just laughed my ass off that I hadn't seen that in the first place. Let me show you why. Awesome, so here I have my Argon cylinder. It's been a while since I used it. So these things usually come in with, you know, fuller about 200 bar, 200 atmospheres. Um, which means that if I just open this directly, <laughs> you get a lot of gas out of this guy. So I'm just going to do this briefly for a sec. Yeah, that's, that's not even fully open. So just to give you some idea of the gas pressure that you're going to get out. I've been getting a lot of these sorts of things recently. You know, universe is made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, and this one's a huge Sebastian. Eh, the last one. Anyway, right. So we're going to have that on there. And let's see what a blast from my cylinder will do. Okay, right. So that's what 100 atmospheres will do. 
Um, now it probably wasn't even fully open, but quite impressive. But obviously, a hundred atmospheres like that is not that much use. So we have these things called regulators on cylinders. So the first gauge here. This one tells you how much um, pressure is in the cylinder. So that goes up to 300 bar, that one. And this one tells you how much pressure is coming out of your little hole here. Right? So let's get that. Oops. Right, so let's get that on to our cylinder. So when I open up the cylinder, let me just check this is all closed, good. When I open up the cylinder, you'll see it pressurizes. Okay, so we're down to, where are we? We're down to about eh, 50 atmospheres or something. So what I'm gonna do in the first instance, I'm just gonna open this up to about one bar, just to give you some idea of the gas flow that you can get going through here at one atmosphere. Right, and with one atmosphere, I can usually close it off with my finger, no problem. You usually hold up to about five atmospheres with your finger. Right, well let's, let's take that all the way down again. Now, let's take a look at what pressure they're actually going to be doing all of their Hyperloop stuff with, which is 0.1 of an atmosphere, which is, uh, even that's 0.2 of an atmosphere. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's okay, let, let's, let's dial it up like this. There's, that's, this is the pressure they want to levitate the Hyperloop with. And even that, that's, that's half an atmosphere there. <laughs> that's, uh, Yeah, so we need it such that when we're levitating, we've got about half, a 0.1 of an atmosphere of pressure. It's about there somewhere. That is what they plan to levitate the, levitate the Hyperloop with. You see, atmospheric pressure is give or take 10 tons per square meter. So if I had a pod of theirs, let's say their pod weighs 10 tons, and in the first instance, I'm gonna say it sat on a total area of air ski that is about a square meter. So the pressure on that air ski pushing down is about 10 tons per square meter. So we would need 10 tons per square meter pushing up in order to gain lift, which is conveniently about one atmosphere of pressure. Now they wanna do the same levitation, but with one tenth of the pressure, which you can do, it's just it means you need 10 times as much area of air ski to do it. So they need at least 10 meters of air ski surface area to get this levitation. Now, if you take a look at roughly what Elon Musk is proposing, he's proposing having about 30 square meters of air ski to levitate this thing on. Now, bear in mind, if you take a look at the diameter of his pods, they're only going to be about a meter wide. On page 15 of the white paper, all oh, glory to the white. The dimensions of the pods are given by 1.35 times 1.1 meters. Uh, so let's be super generous and say the bottom of the pod is a meter wide. That means that the air ski is going to be about 30 meters long. Uh, let's take a look at how that would reflect versus his actual artist's impression. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is gonna be a little tricky. But if you look at the other places of his document, he says this is these pods are gonna take about 30 people. Well, we can see how big two people are in these pods, so, well, that's great. Let's actually do an accurate artist impression of what Elon Musk's pods are going to look like. So, you know, we need about 15 times this length of pod, which is about this. Oh, and then, of course, we need an end on the pod. Very important, that end. So that's what Elon Musk pods are more accurately going to look like, really. Long, thin structures like this tend to be flexible and, and oscillate and vibrate and all sorts of things like that. And you have at best one millimeter clearance. You, you lose that one millimeter clearance from having this thing perfectly evenly loaded over that 30 square meters and you will be grinding metal at the best part of a thousand miles per hour. Yeah, I mean, the sort of thing that you can see killing this 
is say, for instance, a fat guy he bends over or something. That sort of readjustment in the loading would probably be enough to get you to grind metal. And this is before you get into the fact that these air bearings are meant to be working in a vacuum, which is something that no one has ever done before and have them traveling at near supersonic speeds, which no one has ever done before all with a millimeter clearance on a track that is a thousand miles long, traveling at a thousand miles per hour. Pretty complicated, Elon. It's like a tube with an air hockey table. It's really, I swear it's not that hard. <laughs> like I was saying, air bearings are a colossally dumb idea from the beginning. And they were dropped by virtually everyone the second they took a serious look at it, including Musk himself. Um, wheels. Trying to defend the white paper with its air bearings at this point. By the way, we shall often refer to Elon's legendary Hyperloop white paper from 2013. He's kind of like trying to say, hey, this Bernie Madoff guy seems like a financial genius. We should definitely invest our money with him. And giving that advice eight years after he's been sent to prison for running the largest Ponzi scheme in history. Or it's like saying, hey, there's this brilliant upcoming disruptive technology firm called Theranos. It's going to completely revolutionize blood testing. And saying that eight years after Theranos went bust. I mean, that's how deep these people are in the cult of Musk. But it also got me looking at the numbers about where they're going to get this compressed gas from, given that the Hyperloop only has about one millibar of pressure in it. Well, they're going to run all of this off a, about 100 millibars, a tenth of an atmosphere or so, of gas. And at that point, no, uh, seriously, 100 to 1 compression. That's not going to happen. The whole point is, of course, that the low density air would be compressed with a compressor at a ratio of 20 to 1. This can be found on page 17 of the Hyperloop white paper. There's even a diagram on page 18 of the white paper showing exactly how the components would be powered and explaining how the compression of the air would work. Cool. So the air comes in here at one millibar and you get a 20 to one compression to get you up to about 20 millibar here. And then there's another five or so times compression, which gets you up to 100 millibar here, which you're going to use to run the air skis. Now there's a cooler in the middle there. And I'll leave it to Chuaxan to give you the completely wrong answer as to why that's there. Of course, it also involves cooling the air to increase the density even more. It's quite technical and it's not necessary to go into full detail here. <laughs> but it's so much more entertaining if you do. I mean, just think for a second how little sense what she just said made. So here we have our gas simulator. And at the moment, it's nice and cold. The number of gas molecules per unit of volume, of course, is the density. So heating it up and cooling it down doesn't actually change the density at all. Cooling the air to increase the density even more. So heating it up and cooling it down doesn't actually change the density at all. It changes the pressure. Pressure is essentially the number of impacts on the side of the vessel. All right, so as we heat it up, you'll see that, you know, per unit time, you get more impacts on the side of the vessel, and that's your pressure. So we're going to cool it down. And the reason I'm going to cool it down is so you can see that when I open this, which is essentially like opening the tap on my gas bottle earlier, a blast from my cylinder will do. The number of gas molecules that leave is essentially the thrust. And as you can see, when the gas molecules aren't moving very quickly, you don't get a lot of thrust. However, if I heat the gas up, and keep heating it up, and keep heating it up, and keep heating it up, then first of all, the pressure increases, and now when I open the top of the bottle again, for exactly the same amount of time, you will see that the more gas molecules leave, and when they leave, they leave quicker. It provides more thrust. So why does she think that they're cooling this down again? Oh, right, to increase the density. 
They're both a kilogram. But steals heaven and feathers. I mean, even if Dwaxan here only understood conservation of energy, just conservation of energy, nothing else, nothing about the you know kinetic theory of gases or anything like that, just conservation of energy. It's written there in the figure in front of her that they put energy in to compress the gas, then they take energy out of the gas, which means there's less energy in the gas. But it suffices to say that the compressor together with the cooler would compress the low pressure air enough so that the turbine would certainly not explode. Uh, well, that's a beautiful and totally wrong explanation. In reality, the reason you don't get a 100 to 1 compression is because you would melt your compressor. Now, this is actually quite nice thermal on camera. So that means that if I take just a regular pot bottle, just polyethylene terephthalate, I am, and I'm going to compress it and we're going to see what happens to the temperature. Look at that. Most people know that when you compress gas in, in, say, for instance, a bike pump, it gets hot. And the more you compress it, the hotter it gets. So here I have a system at about 300 Kelvin, that's more or less room temperature. And this is actually what happens when you compress a gas. So take a note of the volume. I'm going to probably compress this with a 4 to 1 ratio, something like that. And this is actually a pretty decent simulation of a gas. So as I move the wall, the movement of the wall actually starts accelerating the gas molecules because, you know, it's, it's literally like hitting the, wall, the, the air molecules with a bat. So already we've gone up from 300 Kelvin to 500. And if we do the complete compression here, all of a sudden we're up to 1,000 Kelvin, um, which is, you know, hot enough to melt steel. And that was all done. This, this is why bike pumps heat things up. It's why compression heats gases. And it's also why the Hyperloop stops here at a 20 to 1 compression because the temperature is already up to about red hot. At that point, if they went straight for another five times compression on the gas that they have, they would melt their Hyperloop. That's why they have to cool the gas before they can compress it again. Well, once you get up to about 100 to 1 compression like this, the gas heats up to about 1,000 degrees, at which point it really doesn't matter whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit. It's got a pretty healthy red hot glow to it. But don't worry, the Hyperloop's got a solution for this. They're going to use evaporative cooling with water to, to get it below the point when most of the metal used in this device has either softened or melted completely. Now, water is fantastic stuff for cooling like this. You know, you evaporate the water into the environment and it sucks out a crazy amount of heat. In fact, evaporating water to suck out heat from something is fantastic for the exact same reason that it's such a bad idea. It's so energy expensive to try and get water condensed from the air. And they go through the calculations and I've not checked them, but they, they, they look about right that they're gonna need about 300 kilograms of water to cool down this gas so that it doesn't melt everything. Well, that's great. So what are you going to do with all of that water? Well, according to them, they're going to store that water on the pod somehow. That's a big problem. You see, once you've boiled the water, that's what took all the energy out of it. So now you've got all of this water as steam. Now, almost universally, you get gases and you boil them. The expansion factor is about a factor of a thousand. So a kilo of water will expand to about a cubic meter of gas. That's more or less the cross-section of their Hyperloop pod. So if they're boiling 300 kilos of water, they're going to make about 300 cubic meters of steam to store, which if they store it at one atmosphere of pressure, would be a steam container 300 meters long. Awesome. So earlier we had this as the rough realistic profile of what Elon Musk's Hyperloop pods would look like. Except now, because we're using 300 kilos of water to absorb all of this energy, we've got to store the steam, which is a container about 300 meters long. Let's see roughly what that's going to look like. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm not feeling this. The, the air skis might struggle with a millimeter tolerance to tow a tank that big. Hey, I'll tell you what, we can compress the steam such that it doesn't take up as much space. Unfortunately, when you compress gases, they get hotter. So even if we just wanted to compress this tank on the back to the length of the Hyperloop pod some 30 meters, the temperature would increase to over 600 degrees Celsius. This thing would be glowing red hot. Uh, yeah, th this isn't going to happen. And bear in mind, all of this was basically so you could compress the gas with some huge turbine on the front of the Hyperloop to get from one millibar, not to 1000 millibar, which is one atmosphere, but to 100 millibar, which is about a tenth of an atmosphere. Also, they could run on their air skis. Say it with me, Waxan and Sebastian. The white paper is amateur hour. And this is before you get into all the crap that you need for the 100 to 1 compression in the vacuum chamber. I mean, the nearest analogy I could think of was a turbo pump, one of these things. So these are turbo pumps, which are precision pieces of engineering, such that this bit, yeah, the way these work is they just spin ludicrously fast. And because they spin ludicrously fast, of course, there's a lot of stress on this thing. Um, and the, the way these work is, I think they're a solid block of aluminium they start off with, which is then compressed to make it even stronger. And then these are just milled out of the solid. So I actually got this one. Um, I don't even know if it works. If it works, I, I would feel so guilty about taking it apart. But um, I got this one off eBay for eh, a couple of hundred dollars um, because no one knew if it worked. It might work. If it works, it's not seized. That's one thing. Um, but a, a working one, this is a working one. Uh, yeah, even second hand, they're like a thousand bucks, these things. And you, maybe 10,000, something like that. We had to come up with a nuclear something. deterrent, because that always calms everything right down. Remind me again how you made your fortune, Stark. No, oh, never mind how he made his fortune on those turbo pumps, the big turbo pumps in the background. Yeah. Big man in a suit of armor. Take that off. Yes, what are you? those rather unimpressive looking tubes in the background are probably twenty to forty thousand dollars worth of turbo pumps. Yeah, this is just to give you some idea. That's the 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 cost of the precision engineering, the precision bearings, and of course, because of that, these things really don't like stress. Um, for certain, you know, you lose a blade on one of these things, the imbalance, uh, the whole, because it's got so much energy in it, the whole thing just dis disintegrates. In the good old days, the the whole thing used to just explode. It used to be quite dangerous to be near a turbo pump that in case in concrete and all sorts. Um, now they've got much better. Um, and I don't know whether that's because they've they've got better at making the blades out of lighter material or, or what, but um, yeah, these are relatively small guys. So if these fail, what happens is you open up the pump afterwards and it's basically full <laughs> of scrap pieces of aluminium because when this thing flies apart when it's you know spinning 10 times faster than a, a jet engine um it it fails quite spectacularly um right so the thing is you would need the compressor on the hyperloop which is starting with millibar pressure on the outside uh, to get the compression ratios that they're after, they would need something like this. Apart from not not just a few inches or centimeters across, but meters, you know, uh, one to four meters, that sort of thing. Uh, they are, and they are very susceptible. You know, if there's any damage to any of the blades, that's it. The whole thing is unbalanced. They only work when they're balanced. The whole thing just disintegrates. Bad news bears if that's on the front of your Hyperloop capsule. Um, or the other thing is, you know, you, you go over bumps. They don't, these things don't like being shaken when they're at speed, obviously, because this thing uh, is just the gyroscopic uh, action. It wants to keep spinning in this plane. You rock this around and that, that'll destroy your pumps pretty quick as well. Cool. So I'm going to try and spin this guy up just to give you an idea of what they look like. Uh, you can't run these things um, at atmospheric pressure. 
because they the motors just burn out too much stress on them. They, you usually need a pretty decent vacuum on these things before they start functioning um, sensibly. So we have to, uh, let's come down a little, we have to get that guy plugged in there. I'm not quite sure which way he goes on. That feels hopeful. Awesome. That's that guy locked on. That's for the speed controller, <coughs> which is a box of electronics, which is also fairly expensive. But um, right, so now let me get that plugged in and we'll see it spin up. Should hopefully get him to spin up. So, uh, yeah, they spin up very quickly and I've depowered it now, and you get an idea of just how good the bearings are on this thing by how long it takes it to stop spinning. And you you could hear that one because it, it's pumping at atmospheric pressure. These things don't usually pump at atmospheric pressure. They need a, a, a very low pressure. You know, because like I was saying, otherwise you put too much strain on the motors, you put too much strain on the blades, and that's all bad news bears. However, fortunately, I have over here a mass spectrometer. Cool, so this in here is the mass spectrometer. Actually nowhere near as complicated as it might first seem. Most of this is just pumps. So this is a diaphragm pump under there. Uh, that's When I turn this on, that's the first thing you'll hear start up. And then this is the turbo pump. Fairly small turbo pump, but this one's new and really quite expensive. I, yeah, this is probably on its own a few thousand dollars, probably three to five, something like that. And all that's going to do is it's going to supply a really good vacuum here, and the guy on the end is basically the mass spectrometer. So let's turn it on and see what happens. So that's the um, diaphragm pump starting up. And once that reduces the pressure to a certain threshold, you'll start hearing the turbo pump spin up. And you'll hear it as a whine. And the whine, okay, you can hear it starting to spin up now. As the turbo spin, spins up faster and faster, you'll hear a whine. And that's basically the frequency of the turbo pump. And it gets higher and higher pitch. If you see the, the green light. There we go. This this is the this is the sound of signs at work. Um, yeah, we have liftoff. It just gets higher and higher and higher. So they do get up beyond human hearing. They get beyond twenty thousand hertz, I think. Okay. So, and at that point, I'm going to just turn it off. So now, that's just the sound of the turbo pump. And that's the turbo pump slowly decelerating. So yeah, this is, you know, one of the things with the Hyperloop is you would need something kind of like this on the front of your Hyperloop, um, it's just never going to happen. Oh. And she's coming in to land. So let's go through all the arguments Thunderfoot brings forth against the Hyperloop and debunk them one by one. Hey, yeah. How would that work out for you? All right, we'll call it a draw. Yeah, he came to expose the mistakes of Thunderfoot and ended up humiliating Musk instead. Sebastian, you might have a new home on this channel. Looks like you've got some really good videos about Elon Musk there. Maybe we should take a look at those in a little more detail. So, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's that done. Um... I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, make sure that you hit subscribe so you don't miss out on more uploads like this. And as ever, if you really enjoyed the work of this channel, you can support it directly through Patreon. And uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>